Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Wineskins features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with thoughts on a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. It is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, we will enjoy an interview that I have with Wally Dunn in part one from the series Spotlight, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. We will also look at the life and times of St. Francis of Paola, and we will hear a reflection on the readings for this fourth Sunday of Lent. That and more coming up on Wineskins. With me now is Nancy Voidis, who is the Executive Director of Catholic Charities for Mahoning, Columbiana, and Trumbull Counties. Welcome back to Wineskin. Thank you. We know that housing issues for Catholic Charities really is at the forefront nowadays. There's a lot of people that are in special need. But along with that housing component, there's some other parts of it that really go hand in hand for those that are searching for housing. For example, the financial component, the budget component. Talk about those and why is that important and why does it all have to be kind of copacetic? Okay. One of the programs that Catholic Charities offers in the diocese is a housing counseling program. We're a HUD certified program. We have housing counselors who deal with two, well, actually three major aspects. One of them is foreclosure prevention. So people that are facing possible foreclosure can come in and we usually do some kind of assessment. We try to work with different programs that might help them reassess their mortgage remodify it, something along those lines. We also do a pre-purchase education program where we will work with people who are for the first time going into housing that may need some special help, especially around budgeting, preparing to be a homeowner. We also have a down payment assistance program that we have through the state where we get funds that can help home buyers, usually first time home buyers with some type of down payment program. And then the third component that I add in there is budgeting and financial education. So we're also looking at extending that financial education to people that are seeking rent. So if somebody's calling us because they're being evicted, we want them to go through a budgeting and financial education kind of curriculum so that they can see what led us to get in here and where we're going down the road to keep housing. I mean, the goal is always to keep people in stable housing. In your experience, is the housing situation, people who are really struggling to maintain their home or apartment, is that really getting worse nowadays? I don't know if it's getting worse. I know a lot of people are really challenged. I mean, certainly the issues going on with GM closing are causing people that have mortgages. We have seen a little bit of an increase of people that are already anticipating, what am I going to do when I'm out of a job up there? A lot of people are working in retail and, you know, restaurant, which are fine professions, but they don't usually pay great. Right. So sometimes the rent and uh, what people need to afford as far as rent or mortgages can sometimes, you know, be challenging. The sad thing appears that people really go from month to month with their paycheck. Right. And then if something happens, whether it's an illness or medication or whatever it is, they find themselves struggling and going day to day, really. What can you do to reassure those people that Catholic Charities is really there to help them, not to give a handout, but really to help educate them so this doesn't happen in the future. Right. Well, sometimes people do have a situation that occurs where they don't have a rainy day fund. If they, Mm -hmm. you know, they need tires or they need something happens to their car, sometimes that can really set somebody back. So what we really try to do is help people look at a budget, look at what their income is, and what the expenses are, and where can we be maybe making better decisions about what we're spending our money on so that we can put a little bit away so when those things do happen, they have a little bit of a fund that doesn't set them into a, you know, a tailspin with all of their bills. So sometimes it's just about making good decisions. There's a lot of things out there that attract us to spend money on, and, you know, sometimes you have to really look at how you're spending that money. 
There's another component, I think you call it the Volunteer Income Tax Program. Briefly, what is that about? Yes. In Mahoning County, we're partnering with the United Way and with the IRS, where we have a grant that comes in that provides free income tax for qualified people. It has to be simple income tax. We don't do businesses. We don't do, you know, it's usually simple income tax, but we try to encourage people. We have this partnership in Mahoning, but this is in any of the counties in the diocese. Somebody is probably offering free income tax. AARP usually has sites. I know in Trumbull County, they have a number of sites where they offer free income tax. So that way, we're trying to get people not to be attracted to places where they're going to take a large fee out of your return. We want to make sure they're looking at earn income tax credit, all of the things that they may be eligible for. So there's volunteers that are at sites throughout the county. There are different hours. So if they need evening hours, Saturday hours, YSU and the business school do a lot to help people with uh, preparing income tax as well. They're a partner in this. So it's a, it's a volunteer income tax program where volunteers learn how to help people go through an online income tax preparation. Well, all of these programs are important and certainly seek to help those people that are in those situations. If there are people that are listening or have family or friends that are part of that or in that group or find themselves in those straits, how do they contact Catholic Charities? Our main number in Mahoning County is 744-3320, or they can call. If they call that number and they're in another county, we'll be sure and hook them up to the right phone number. That's probably the easiest thing to tell you right now. They can also call 211 in their communities, and 211 provides information on a variety of different types of services, not necessarily just Catholic Charities, but other community resources as well. Well, Nancy Voigt, this is always a pleasure to have you on Wineskins, but also to tell us some of the important things that are going on through Catholic Charities, especially in Mahoning, Columbiana and Trumbull Counties. Thank you for your work. We always enjoy coming, so thank you for having us again. You're welcome. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. To tell us more about the life and times of St. Francis of Paola is Brother Dominic Calabro. He is from the Society of St. Paul in Canfield and the production assistant for CTNY. Born in Calabria, Italy, Francis entered the Franciscan order at the age of 13 because of a vow his parents had made to St. Francis of Assisi. Two years later, he retired to the life of the hermit. In due time, he attracted followers who shared his ascetical fervor, and later he founded the Order of Hermits of St. Francis of Assisi in 1456. Later, the name was changed to the Order of the Little Ones and was approved by the Holy See in 1506. The observances of the Little Ones were stricter than those of any other religious order at the time, for they not only observed the perpetual fast, but they abstained from eggs and milk as well as meat. Impressed by Francis's fame as wonder worker and a man of extraordinary spiritual gift, Pope Sexus IV sent him to France to serve in the court of Louis IX. After the death of the king, Francis remained as spiritual director of Charles VIII and to serve King Louis XII. Because of his influence at court, he was successful as a peacemaker. St. Francis spent 25 years in France, founding numerous monasteries, and he died there on Good Friday in 1507. He was canonized in 1519 and named the patron of seafarers in 1943. The opening prayer of the Mass begins with an invocation that refers to the charism of his holy founder who, out of humility, never advanced to the priesthood. Father of the lowly, you raise St. Francis of Paola to the glory of your saints. The petition of the prayer is that we may come to the rewards you have promised the humble. The life of this miracle working and austere hermit, who vowed to observe the Lenten fast throughout the entire year, was something truly extraordinary in a society that was so averse to any ascetical practices. His example is significant for us in the light of St. Paul's statement that summarizes the spirituality of St. Francis of Paola, the love of Christ impels us. His rigorous austerity was sustained by his meditation on the passion and death of Christ. This is evident in the letter he wrote to the procurator of a hermitage in Italy. Fix your minds then on the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Inflamed with love for us, he came down from heaven to redeem us. For our sake, 
He endured every torment of body and soul and shrank from no bodily pain. He himself gave us an example of perfect patience and love. We could say that humility was the astounding virtue practiced by St. Francis of Fiola. It was humility that caused him to refuse to be ordained a priest. True humility is difficult to attain, and especially for us today. But it is nevertheless true that our greatness in the eyes of God and people consists in the recognition of our littleness. We can make his deathbed prayer our own. Beloved Jesus, preserve the just, justify sinners, have compassion on all the faithful, living and dead, and be merciful to me, although I am nothing more than an unworthy sinner. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. During this series, we're going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. And joining me in today's show is Wally Dunn. Welcome to Spotlight. Thank you, Father. You know, you've been with the Diocese of Youngstown for a long time. Long time. I think it would be good for the folks that are with us to kind of give us a little background as to the beginnings of how you started with the diocese and what was your position and what that was all about. Well, my first assignment was at St. Paul's Salem, taught seventh and eighth grade. I was there from 65 to 67. I went from there to St. Mary Warren, Ohio. And I was there as a teacher from 67 until I think it was 18, 69, I think it was. And I was assigned as uh, assistant principal, the first lay ad administrator in a Catholic elementary school in our diocese. Okay. Stayed there until the middle school was completed and I was assistant principal in the middle school as well. And then in 71, I moved to St. Edward as principal and I was there until 1989. And in 89, I had the opportunity to go to St. John in Ashtabula as principal. And I was there for three years. And then the diocese, of course, decided to close it right. and formed a couple of corporations. And we reopened it as an independent Catholic mm -hmm. high school. And I appointed myself as president. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hired a principal. Mm -hmm. I was there. I needed a paid job, too. So I went to St. Patrick as principal. And I was doing both jobs for quite a while. And then I dropped out of the St. John job and stayed at St. Patrick Hubbard as principal until the diocese asked me to come down and be director of government programs, resource development at the central office. And I was there from 90, I'm not saying 93 or 95, I think it was. And then after Nick Walsanovich left, Bishop Tobin appointed me as interim superintendent. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Scooby came in as superintendent. I went back to my government programs job and later ended up as assistant superintendent. And that's when I retired out 2011. Okay. So officially retired. Officially. Now, we know that with the church, you really never retire. You that's still right. work or volunteer right. or give your time. Let's talk about Catholic education because that's really one of the mainstays in the Catholic institution. Why are Catholic schools so vital to who we are as Catholics and to our mission? I'd like to look at some hard data on that. Mm -hmm. And I saw your question on the slip that you sent me. Reflecting back on the time of Vatican II, and I happened to be in the schools when Vatican II was just starting to gain, gain traction, mm -hmm. and the schools played a very important role in that, mm -hmm. in helping our students and eventually their parents and the community through the, the change to the vernacular mm -hmm. and the uh, change in the order of the mass and all those kinds of things. So it was critical that kids learned that, and I think sure. we formed kids who became a bridge from Vatican II into mm -hmm. you know, what our traditions have become now. I think, too, I see the schools as critical in the whole tradition of mm -hmm. our Catholic faith. The formative years that we have mm -hmm. and what we're able to do with kids, say to kids and have kids say back to us as students is a critical element in forming those kids into being good, active Catholic citizens. Some years ago, you're, you're too young to remember this, I'm sure, but many years ago there was a, a real brouhaha across the nation because they found out that entertainment companies were introducing into their films mm -hmm. every 10th frame a frame that said eat popcorn mm -hmm. so it was subliminal, subliminal. yes <laughs> and people were outraged at that mm -hmm. but it worked okay and they were outraged at it but you know something sometimes we forget those lessons so mm -hmm. i think some of the subliminal things we do with kids in school too help them respond in ways in which the church would ask them to respond sure. to their life and their society and their culture and their country and their state. And uh, I think we're happy with that. Let's talk about the Catholic schools because many of the institutions, many of the parishes in our diocese and dioceses across the country really had a parish school. Yeah. 
What about those parishes that never had a parish school and don't have schools now? Are there any difference with them? What I see happening there is, you know, in 1965 when I started at uh, St. Paul, there were, I believe, 70,000 kids in our Catholic schools in the Diocese of Youngstown. We now have something, a kiss over 6,000. In 65, that was K through 12, now, or I'm sorry, 1 through 12, now it's K through 12. The parishes that did not have a school in those days gone by cooperated with those parishes that did. And as principal of St. Edward's School, I know, we had students there from uh, Cyril Methodius and Peter and Paul and parishes where they are St. Columba, where they're St. Cyril Methodius, yeah, St. Cyril Methodius, mm -hmm. where their parishes had closed the school, but they cooperated with St. Edward right. and our, we received those kids into our enrollments. Mm -hmm. So even those parishes recognized the importance of Catholic education, their parents recognized it and went to the most available Catholic school. You'll remember the bishop's document uh, some years ago where they said that Catholic education had to be both available, accessible, and affordable. Mm -hmm. I believe parents take that to heart. I think they do. You know, let's talk also about mm -hmm. the sense that there are some Catholic schools that have an overabundance of non-Catholic kids present. Why is that okay or why is that part of our mission? Well, I think we are no less a Catholic school when we have a population that might be 90 or 95 percent non-Catholic. When those parents come in and bring their children into school, they, they well know that those kids are going to be going to a religion class. Right. They have to attend respectfully. Mm -hmm. They are going to be attending the religious services that the rest of the school normally would be going to as well. Mm -hmm. They're not exempt from that. And often, some of our parishes or administrators will invite in some pastors from other denominations mm -hmm. to meet with their kids and to share their life experiences and their faith experiences. They're very ecumenical yeah. in, in that way. I think it's been very good for us. We find a large, larger number of uh, the non-Catholic kids coming in through the Ed Choice program, the state-supported program. Mm -hmm. It has had a tremendous impact on our schools, especially the center city schools. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, please visit the website www doy.org of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown for more information. Stay with us. We'll be right back. After the Catholics of Warren stopped meeting in their homes and organized a structured parish, they used a former Episcopal church for their worship. St. Mary's Mission was established in 1837, yet the first resident pastor did not come to the parish until 1868. Other parishes quickly grew up in Trumbull County, including St. Stephen Niles in 1853, St. Patrick Hubbard in 1869, St. Vincent de Paul Vienna in 1871, now called St. Thomas the Apostle, and St. Rose Gerard in 1892. The other 15 parishes in the county were established after the turn of the 20th century. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. The Johnsons enjoy Friday dinners out, nothing fancy, just time together to reconnect as family. They make sure others eat as well. By giving to Catholic Charities of Youngstown, the Johnsons join other angels who care for those in need, regardless of religion or race. Show your wings with a gift to Catholic Charities changing lives one family at a time, providing housing, emergency financial assistance, senior services, and more. Give now at ccdoy.org. Our music today is provided by Lenten Journey. It is from their CD called What Wondrous Love. Yes.
On this, the fourth Sunday of Lent, we will hear more about the Sacred Scriptures by Deacon Paul Lisko. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. I once received a card that had a picture of a bear on the outside with the words, The secret of happiness lies deep down within us. If we listen closely enough, we can hear that voice calling out. And then, on the inside of the card, were these words, Send down a chocolate donut. Now, chocolate donuts might not be the secret to happiness, but the stirring in the stomach, even if it was a questionable motivation, was enough to turn the prodigal son back home. He remembered his former happiness, regretted his sins, and just wanted some place in his father's home, even if it was a servant. It had gone all wrong for him, but his homecoming was more than he could have ever expected. When we sin, we usually try to convince ourselves that something that we know is wrong is somehow right. If we have enough courage to admit it, we soon realize that we're no longer happy. We can't be at war with God and at peace with ourselves. We can try, but it won't work. And we're not at peace with ourselves. We are overwhelmed with what we perceive as the darkness in others, and we are masters at blaming others. As a result, we can have a difficult time seeing the beauty, the truth, and the goodness in our world. But when we could muster up the courage to say to God, I'm sorry, and realize that He responds, You're forgiven. We can be happy with ourselves and with our world. Yes, we'll still have to recognize that there is sin in the world, but this negativity takes a back seat to our sense of the overwhelming goodness of God's creation. How many times after a good confession do we have this profound realization of the beauty in the world and the joy of having our guilt removed is the focus of this Sunday. The forgiving father runs out to meet his son. He doesn't even wait for him to finish his little speech because he's overwhelmed with joy. And the son felt the joy of being forgiven and restored to a loving relationship with his father. Look, we all have battle stories. We all have had people who have callously hurt us I've been offended, and so have you. But if we don't forgive those who have hurt us, we will be keeping ourselves out of the banquet of God's intimacy. We will take our anger to the grave, and that will fix them, won't it? If we want to receive God's forgiveness, we have to give God's forgiveness. If we don't forgive others, we will end up standing outside of the banquet, griping and grousing, just like the elder son did in today's gospel. But more importantly, we will end up separating ourselves from God's love. At the end of the parable, only the elder son is absent from the banquet. And sadly, he did this to himself. This man eats with sinners. And that's true. He welcomes and eats with us. He shows us a better way to live, a way free from sin. The parable of the prodigal son, forgiving father, and elder brother is a perfect depiction of our human condition, our weaknesses, and the unlimited compassion that God offers to us if we are willing to turn from sin and hatred, and welcome his forgiveness. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Paul. There is a verse in the book of James that says, When a man knows the right thing to do but doesn't do it, he sins. In the eyes of God, respectable sins can be just as deadly as the vulgar sins. Wineskins is made possible through the annual Bishop's Appeal, 
the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Our program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, thanking you for being with us today. Have a blessed week. have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.